You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Thank you so much for being here. I am excited to be here with you today. We have a returning guest. His name is Jack Salmon, and he is uber intelligent, and he understands economics far better than I ever will. And it's our pleasure to have him here uh, explaining something that I've kind of been curious about. We're raising interest rates, but what effect is that going to have on the economy? Jack is a Young Voices contributor and a writer on economics. His commentary has been featured in a variety of outlets, including The Hill, Business Insider, Real Clear Policy, and National Review Online. Jack, thanks so much for coming back on the show. We really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me back, Chris. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So uh, t- tell me, how did you get into economics? Like what fueled your fire and made you want to get into this particular topic as a research area? It's a great question with quite a long background, but it, it really started in high school. Um, I I was curious about economics, and so I took an economics class, and my, stu- my my teacher at the time was an ardent trade unionist and a socialist, and I just thought it was very narrow, sort of tunnel vision view of economics. And so I discovered Milton Friedman, and I started reading Capitalism and, ca- capitalism and Freedom, and I was I, I loved challenging her and getting her upset in class. And so it, it, it sort of spurred, spurred an interest in economics for me. And I, I went on to study at college and I've, I've always loved it. That is very similar to me and a policy, poli sci professor I had in college during the Iraq lead up. I was a, I was a good little bushy back in 2004, oh. but that seems to be like a, a common theme amongst libertarians and conservatives and people who kind of, are of a free market mindset of like, you know what? I went to college and then they just said a bunch of stuff that didn't make sense. And I really just needed to disagree with them. And I didn't know how. So I went and looked it up. Do you find that to be like a common thing amongst uh, other people that you talk to? It is. And I've, I've heard it quite a lot in my circles that people felt disheartened when they were in college or they, they, they felt that they had been singled out because they felt that they thought in a slightly different way. And I think that just pushes people further towards um, sort of opposing ideas of central planning and top-down organization, which is a great thing. Absolutely. I think being sort of having a gut feeling this isn't right and going back and looking it up, it's a, a great, great training ground. So you had a an article in National Review that caught my eye on Halloween, a very spooky article about it's titled How a Decade of Low Interest Rates Fueled Reckless Government Spending. Now, I don't know a ton about interest rates. So let's start there. Like define what an interest rate. And when I see there's a seven point or three point increase in the interest rate, what does that mean? So there's there's two different types of interest rates we, we can talk about here. There's the interest rates that um, are the federal funds interest rate. So that's the interest rates that the Federal Reserve sets um, on its on its reserves. But those those rates will actually have an impact on on all interest rates, whether it's private. So it could be um, s- s- loans that you have, it could be credit cards, could be um, mortgages, c- car loans, but also um, the public sector. So it affects the government's finances. The government, um, as it rolls over its debt, it, it, it goes into either lower interest rates or higher interest rates, depending on wh- which direction they're heading in. And um, the issue we have now is, is, is that we've been in a situation of sort of artificially low interest rates for really over a decade since the great financial crisis. And so policymakers have been in this mindset that we're always going to have low and steady interest rates. And so the future is very predictable. And because of this, they continually, continuously racked up larger and larger debts because they could just roll over the, the newly maturing debt into low in, in, into low interest rate debt, and so the cycle continues. The issue there is, we now ended up with uh, a huge debt, most of which has very short term maturities. What I mean by maturities is, when the treasury rolls over its debt, it can either choose to to buy um, long term debt, so debt that it won't have to pay back for thirty years, but the interest rate would be higher because it's longer term, or they could choose to roll it over into short term debt which could be a year, two years, three years, and the interest rate would be much lower. So it's much cheaper to do that. 
So because rates have been so low for so long, they, they rolled most of our debt into short-term maturities. So we're now in a situation where 50% of our debt matures in three years or less. 30% of our debt, now that, that's $24 trillion. 30% of that $24 trillion matures in the next year, in the next 365 days. Now that is a problem when interest rates have gone from effectively zero to about three, 4% where they are now. We're talking about trillions of dollars. And so, uh, so, that is so be I'm guessing they're going to roll that into something else. They're not obviously going to be able to pay that, let alone pay it. So do they then roll that into more short term? But you're saying the problem is that it goes from, you know, I, I really think maybe my entire adult life, the interest rate at the Fed has been around zero from, you know, when I graduated during 9-11 to now. Uh, so they just keep rolling that over. Do they keep rolling that into short term? What consequences does that maturation have? Maybe the first question, let me ask you. So when they when they buy these bonds, is it treasury bonds or what? How do they what do they actually buy to float the debt? So these are treasury bonds um, and and that there are all kinds of buyers of treasury bonds. Um, international central banks buy U.S. treasury bonds. Uh, the Federal Reserve buys treasury bonds. Investors buy treasury bo treasury bonds. If you're an investor and and you you own a a bond fund, it probably has treasuries in there somewhere. Uh, pension funds will buy will buy treasury bonds. So they're they're really sort of a liquid asset that, that floats around the market. But um, they they will roll they 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 would roll over into short term treasury bonds typically when interest rates go higher, but what we've seen this year in particular is interest rates spiking across the board. The, the issue is the shorter term treasury bonds are more sensitive to changes in the Federal Reserve interest rate. So because the Fed is now hiking rates up upwards to 5%, that's impacting the one year, two year, three, three year treasuries far more than it's influencing the 10 year, 30 year. So they really have no cheap option to roll over into. And so all the debt they carried over during 2020, when interest rates were effectively zero, they're now having to put those into treasury bonds with interest rates of, of 4% and up. And so I I anticipate this year, 2023, um, I, I, I tend to track the federal budget. I anticipate the interest payments on the debt this year being about the same as the entire defense budget. That's how bad it's going to be. Holy cow. And, and that's always sort of the go-to libertarian line of well we can cut the defense budget and let's save money there but that's very unrealistic in terms of how the overall picture of the federal budget is is so what what does this mean for your average listener that that may be listening going all right this sounds scary but how does that impact me well on the in the private sector it, it means that private loans are also going to be suffering from higher interest rates so if you have credit card debt it's going to affect you if you have a mortgage it's going to affect you if you uh, if, if you're planning to buy a new house, sorry, I should say, it's going to affect your car loans. Um, it's going to affect you. But on the public sector side, the the effect of of, of increasingly costly debt, it, it means that capital is going to be crowded out. So th there are only a limited number of investors in the marketplace. They either, tr they either choose to invest in private companies or they buy government bonds. Now, because the interest rates are going up, people are seeing government bonds as being a more attractive investment. I don't know if you've heard of uh, I savings bonds. It's just one of the, the treasury bonds that, that the, the treasury um, issues, but um, they've been offering 9% interest rates. So people are not investing in companies. They're not investing in, in the private sector because of this, these huge spikes in interest rates. That means that there's less business growth. It means there's less jobs available. It means there's going to be less wage growth in the foreseeable future. So it's, it's going to start hurting people in those terms. Um, so there's that effect on the private sector. But then the, is the issue from the, public from the public sector perspective is it's going to worsen deficits. It's, it's going to worsen de debt sustainability, which means it's going to increase pressures on government to do things like raise taxes. So that's it. it, it it's really it's, it's a lose lose situation, which then decreases the amount of money that there is to pay more in salaries and for further investments, which creates less job growth, which creates less private sector. Right, right. Capitalization. So one of the big risks there is stagflation, which I think we, 
we, we, we could be moving into a, an environment of stagflation in the next year or two. Can you explain what that is? And, and talk about Japan. I'm, I'm not an expert on Japan, but I, I've heard Japan thrown around as an example, both for and against more government spending. So I, I, it's, 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 one of those, it's one of those anomalous countries that I'm always baffled by. But, well, I, I mentioned that because they have famously been in stagflation, and I, I oh, uh, I'm about twenty percent it through a book called uh, "The Lost Generation" about you know an entire generation of young people in Japan who just never had the same amount of economic opportunity as the high growth of the of the previous two generations, and it was largely due to the concept of stagflation. Now, I should have just said, please explain stagflation to me. So my apologies. <laughs> No, no, you, it, it, it's fine. And uh, they used to call it the lost decade, but J Japan really now it's, it's it's been three decades of essentially zero growth. Um, the, the government there has racked up such a large debt. I think the last time I looked, it's something like two hundred and sixty percent of GDP is their total public debt. Ours is a hundred, and that's already problematic and it's causing issues. And they've also been living in this fantasy that they can keep rolling over the debt because of low interest rates. By some miracle, they haven't yet seen a spike in interest rates in the same way that we're currently seeing or that we saw in the 1970s and 80s. But that doesn't mean we should put all our eggs in one basket and follow suit. It, it, it's really quite terrible. And, and what they've seen there is since since the, about the mid 90s, there's been effectively zero wage growth in Japan. Uh, there's been a, effectively cl close to zero economic growth. It, 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 they tend to cheer, uh, Japanese government ministers cheer when they see 1% growth. So it's really quite a depressing sort of utopian situation to, to be looking at. And uh, it's, it's not something we should we should be looking towards mimicking here, because um, I often hear some economists say, well, Japan's doing just fine. They have a huge debt and they seem to be doing fine. They're, they're definitely not doing very fine. You only have to speak to a young Japanese worker and you, you, you'll very quickly find out it's quite problematic. Uh, what would explain that? What do you hear? So one of the arguments that I hear um, sort of in opposition to, to my arguments against wrapping up more debt is that there is no threshold level where, whereby which our debt starts to become damaging economically or starts to start to hurt us in that sense. And they always point to Japan and they say, well, Japan has been wrapping up debt for 30 years. They reached 100 percent of GDP. Nothing bad happened. The world, the, the world didn't end. They reached 200. The world didn't end. But what they're really talking about is they're talking about uh, the risk of a fiscal crisis, something like what we saw in Greece in 2010. I'm not saying that that's definitely going to happen here in the US, but the situation in Japan is is arguably worse than what happened in Greece. A sort of slow kill is is far more painful than a sharp fiscal crisis. I would rather have a sharp fiscal crisis and then have fiscal fiscal consolidation and try and get our house in order in a short period of time rather than a sort of 30 year drag of stagflation. Yeah, you that it sounds like you can't buy a house, your um your wage doesn't grow, but the like inflation grows. <laughs> I mean, we've we've kind of I, there's that famous chart that you always kind of see on libertarian meme accounts, right? Of when we are we're taking off the gold standard and you know, inflation goes up, but wages just kind of flatline. And that this sort of feels like that's where we've where we've been and where we're going. And it's very frustrating because people don't really know how to fix it. So how do you how do you start to fix this? How do you start to unwind this? The inflation or the debt? They're, they're two very big obstacles. They're very different. I, I think I think uh, a lot of people get those two things mixed up or think they may be the same thing, right? Like, well, they're certainly interrelated. And, right. And they bring their own risks. One of the things I'm worried about talking about the sort of intersection between debt and inflation is that as, as the debt gets larger, uh, policymakers, so the sort of pe people in control of the fiscal apparatus, so the, the spending and taxes, they, they start putting pressure on, on, on the central bank. We call this fiscal crisis, and, uh, sorry, uh, fiscal dominance. In economics, it's it, it's where the Federal Reserve would would essentially lose its independence because policymakers would put pressure on them to keep interest rates low, to keep the cost of financing debt lower into the future, and so that's the risk that comes with with racking up more debt. But, but where inflation comes into that is 
if we saw a spike in inflation and we had a huge debt, there would be reluctance to tackle the inflation by raising interest rates because they wouldn't want to, to spike the cost in, in debt servicing for, for those fiscal authorities. So you have a sort of clashing of heads there. And that's, that, that's a real risk that we face if we keep racking up debt. Can, can I ask why, why do they raise interest rates to tame inflation? And, and does that work? So, the, well, well, first, you have to look to the underlying causes of inflation. Um, in 2020 and in sort of the early part of 2021, there were some supply restraints, which are inevitable when you shut down and when the government forces a shutdown of the entire economy, you're going to have some sort of um, s- supply chain capacity recovering over time. And so supply was down and that, that, that drove up prices temporarily. But what ultimately happened was we had a $700 billion uh, output gap, which means that our economy was about $700 billion below where it should have been looking at pre-pandemic trends. And rather than, than spend a small amount of money to sort of close that gap or to allow the private sector to close the gap, which is what they should have done, they should have unleashed the private sector, they decided to spend $2 trillion. And so not only did we close that gap, but we overshot the gap, we overheated the economy, we put trillions of dollars in excess savings in people's pockets. And so it was, in the end, it was demand that really caused the inflation spike that we saw in 2021. And so where the Federal Reserve and and the hiking interest rates comes into this is they have to raise the cost of of consumption, of of, of taking out credit, of of spending to bring down inflation back to sort of sustainable levels. So to, in simple economic terms, to, to, to bring back demand to supply. Uh, to bring to bring it back to equilibrium, so yeah, can... it has to be more expensive for you to put things on a credit card, to buy a car on credit, to buy a house on credit, right. to to slow down the amount of spending in the economy, so it, it starts to dry some of that up. So the fiscal the fiscal authorities in Congress caused the inflation, and now the monetary authorities are going to have to crash the economy to try and bring the inflation down which no doubt will then lead to fiscal authorities saying, oh, well, now we need stimulus. Right. And the cycle continues. So I see that a lot of people preparing for 2023 in an economic slowdown, a recession, uh, you say crash the economy. I think that's a scary phrase for a lot of people who are, are, are kind of unaware of what's going on. How do you think the next year or two plays out economically for just your average person? Start with the the macro and then work down to the micro. I guess is the way to ask it. Yeah, I I don't know that I can speak to sort of on the very micro individual level, but I suspect the soft landing that we keep hearing about is is kind of out of question at this point. Uh, I I don't see that happening. Um, I I saw a study released by uh, Larry Summers, who who has been, actually been fairly good throughout this sort of in, inflation sur- surge at, at making certain predictions and making calls. He was opposed to the American Rescue Plan as well very early on. And um, he thinks that the unemployment rate is going to have to go up to about six and a half percent before inflation comes back down to trend. So that's something that I think is is certainly possible in in the next year or two. I think it's um, at two percent right now. It's very, very low. Right? Yeah, it's something. Uh, Around three, I think, around three percent, a little there above, roughly where it was um, back in back in late 2019, before before all the all the madness happened. But um, so I so I think there's some risk of um, slightly higher unemployment, um, nowhere near what we typically see in a, in a business cycle recession. But six seven percent is, is is certainly on the books, and I and I think. Um, Another risk that comes is is that we don't actually get inflation back down to two percent, which is something that I'm that I'm increasingly starting to worry about. Uh, I think once we get it down to about four percent, there might be some reluctance to to, to to go any further, and and so we end up shifting the target, and that's something I, that I'm worried about now, having a three or four percent inflation target. So to so to put it in other words, we're at what eight percent, seven percent inflation right now. Yeah. And that roughly, for anybody who doesn't understand, that roughly means in, inflation is is what it is the amount of money that's in circulation, or the co- overall cost. You could see it. So, so 
it's essentially uh, the easiest way to describe it. Jack is, spends um, so much time thinking about this stuff that this is very difficult for to explain to him who's someone who got a C in Mr. Early's economics. I can see it in his face, but I warned him ahead of time. This is Econ 101, buddy. <laughs> um, so too much demand and too few goods is the simplest way to, to describe it. But you can also describe it in monetary terms. A monetarist inter interpretation would be that... Um, you essentially print money and so you devalue the currency and so it's the it, it's the amount of devaluation on an annual basis in the currency is sort of monetarist interpretation of it and really for what 20 30 years we've had two percent inflation and it's been like setting your watch to it and so why so many people are having trouble right now is in their industry they may they may see 15 percent inflation and so they priced out two percent two percent two percent 15 oh man we're way underpriced raise the prices and so if we were just to stay at 4% inflation, what, what does that do to the economy long term? So my, my key fear with, with raising the target is, 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 is like you quite rightly said, since really since the, the 70s, 80s, um, we've set 2% as the, as the target. And it's not just in the US. It's also in my home country of the UK, we have a 2% inflation target all over Europe. Um, pretty much every advanced economy in the world has a target either at 2% or somewhere between 1% and 3%. And so there's a, there's a fairly strong consensus. So this has um, anchored expectations. So every consumer sort of is either aware that we typically have about 2%, thereabouts, inflation every year, or they just don't care because inflation is so low and so stable that it's not something that they worry about on a day-to-day basis because it's, it's, it's 2%, it's close to zero. The problem with having 4% is it's far more visible. Um, it could unanchor people's expectations. And they may think, well, if they can if they can double the inflation target to 4%, why not 5 Why not 6 And so it creates a lot of uncertainty. Um, it, 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 it shifts people's expectations. And I think that could create a lot of volatility within the economy. And I, I think that's a real risk that, that, that we shouldn't be posing. Uh, and consistency is like the key. Right. Like predictability, especially for businesses and for your household. Right. You, you, when you go, I go to the grocery now for one hundred and fifty dollars worth of groceries and it's two two hundred and twenty dollars. Right. That that predictability is very um, dangerous. So so I know it's very, very unkind to ask for predictions. But, um, you know, when you say there's no soft landing, like. Do you think it looks like 2008? Does it look like the Great Depression? Like, I, I think give some give someone a sense of like, you know, work's going to slow down. Jobs are going to slow down. It may be harder to find a job or dig up the silver. Start selling it now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. um, give it give us some idea of, of what that means for a slowdown in the next year. So I don't think it's going to be anything like um 2008 or something like that 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 was a a fairly deep recession and then we also had a very slow recovery I, it's going to be something similar to what we saw in the early 80s um not hopefully not quite to that extent um we're going to have to to to, to hike interest rates the fed is going to have to hike interest rates to about five percent and then probably hold them there for a year or two that that's going to cause but that's definitely going to cause an economic downturn. Whether or not you call it a soft landing or a hard landing is, is, is still in question. I'm leaning towards, towards hard landing. But we're already starting to see um, layoffs happening in the tech sector. So I've seen some companies announcing, and it's not just Twitter, I've seen some companies announcing layoffs of 20% of, 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 their, of their workforce, some tech companies. And the reason we're seeing tech companies go first is because they're the ones who have, number one, benefited the most from the years of low interest rates. And number two, they, they they sort of had an artificial spike in employment during the, um, the these companies have never made profit. They're like the perfect example of the American economy of we always predict growth, so we always just take out credit, and we're always running over margins and run deficits. And like I I don't know if Amazon zombie economies in economic uh, zombie companies in economics. It that that's also another huge problem they have in Japan. About half their economy is essentially zomb zombie companies, but the the other reason tech companies um, are, the, are the first ones to start to see layoffs is 
they they saw an artificial um, bump during 2020 because of everybody going remote and all these companies suddenly needed to em employ thousands of of IT workers and 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 so it's those companies that sort of helped get people through those through those months when everybody was 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 essentially at home most of the time whether it was um, delivery services or using Google Meets or whatever it was. So those companies really saw an artificial growth in their labor markets during, the, during that time. And that's now starting to come back down to reality combined with the spike in interest rates. So I think we're gonna see more, more, more layoffs in the non-tech sector as we move into 2023, but I, I don't think it's gonna be as painful as previous recessions. This isn't a business cycle, uh, a, a typical business cycle recession. This is really a Fed induced recession. And so I think it's slightly more manageable, but it's still, it's not going to be, I don't think it's going to be a soft landing. We're not going to hold you to it either way, but we appreciate your insight and your education and uh, having you on. It's always great to talk to you, Jack. You always, um, if you give me something to think about that, I, I just don't spend a lot of time reading the intricacies of this stuff. And uh, it's really fascinating to see how these macroeconomic policies impact us on a daily basis, whether we think about it or not. Yeah, I'm always glad to come on and and and, and help try to like explain this. Um, I'm I'm always explaining these things to, to different audiences, and so I'm glad to have these discussions. I really enjoy it. Well, thanks so much, Jack. Shameless self promotion time. Where can people follow your work? Uh, you can follow my, all of my work, um, all of my interviews, my articles, and um, if if you're interested, my Twitter handle. It, it, it's all on my um, Young Voices bio page under Jack Salmon. All right, we'll link that in the show notes. Thanks so much, Jack. We really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks, Chris. Have a good thank, one. Thank you so much for listening to The Chris Spangle Show. If you learned something, if you found this interesting, then the best thing you can do is share it with your friends and family. Word of mouth is how your favorite podcast grows, and we are no different than that. So thank you. We will see you again soon, and we'll uh, talk to you again next time.